two, three. Okay, um, we are quite heavily behind time. And we're supposed to get through two panel sessions before lunch, which means we're going to have to ask colleagues to be brief, to be succinct and to the point. I'm going to cut you off if you take more than the allocated time. Uh, the, the organizer for this particular session, which is a very, very important session on nutrition and food systems in Africa, situation, challenges, and opportunities, they allocated 45 minutes for this session. And then on the program, it's designated for four speakers at 10 minutes and then 15 minutes Q&A, which, I mean, I'm not a math genius, but that seems to be 55. So what, since we're behind time and since uh, I am going to really impress upon the speakers, if you can take seven to eight minutes maximum, short, succinct, to the point. If it's PowerPoint, you can go through the PowerPoint quickly so that we can at least have some time for an exchange with colleagues in the audience. Um, we have four very distinguished speakers on this panel. Um, I'm going to introduce them as, as they speak. And uh, the first speaker on this panel is a dear colleague of mine, Dr. Hamadi Diop. Hamadi is head of natural resources, governance, food security, and nutrition at the NEPAD agency. I didn't introduce myself. I'm assuming this is a, a room of friendly faces and familiar faces. But my name is Tandagan Kiwane, for those who don't know me. I'm special advisor to the CEO of the NEPAD agency. So Hamadi will speak on the topic, CADAP Results Framework and Progress on Agenda 2063 Implementation. Hamadi, the floor is yours. PowerPoint to load. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, first of all, let me thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the key achievements we have made in terms of uh, moving the continental agenda on agriculture. Um, so before I start, let me give you a, a very quick brief overview of where we came from. So um, while I'm waiting for the PowerPoint to load, uh, we as a NEPAD agency, we were established in 2011 as a secretariat, and then in 2002 we were adopted as, a, as an AU program. In 2011 we were integrated into the AU as a specialized agency, and uh, since 2017 uh, the head of state have decided that we would be uh, transformed into a development agency for the African Union. I just wanted to put these things there so that you know where we are coming from. We have a very nice uh, footprint in the continent. We are present in the nine. In, 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 we are covering about 95 percent of uh, of the continent. We have four programs, and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of the program. So, in my presentation today, what I would like to do is to give you uh, a very brief overview uh, on the Agenda 2063, which is titled also uh, "The Future We Want." Uh, then I will uh, proceed by uh, sharing with you a few trends that we have observed in the continent. Uh, I will uh, follow up uh, that uh, basically that uh, those trends with uh, some few guiding frameworks that we are using to guide basically implementation of our agriculture agenda in the continent. Uh, then I will provide you with a very quick snapshot on where we are at the moment and uh, where we are heading uh, next. Uh, I'm not sure whether my presentation is ready, but uh, I will just continue with Agenda 2063. So Agenda 2063 uh, is, an is an aspiration. It has seven uh, thematic aspirations, one on a prosperous, prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Uh, another aspiration uh, viewing the continent uh, as an integrated continent politically united. Uh, next, please. Uh, and next. Uh, next. Okay. So these are the seven uh, aspirations that we, we have in the Agenda 2063. Uh, one comment I can make is that the Agenda 2063 is very timely. It came at the moment uh, where the conducive, conducive environment was favorable. Uh, so basically what the agenda is looking at uh, is how we can secure effective interface 
between our national planning processes, our sub-regional initiatives, and our continental programs? How can we have a vision in the future and make sure that we are all as member states developing national strategies that could be compliant with that future, future uh, so that we can all move as one and try to achieve a, a common goal? So, uh, but in terms of transformation and in terms of implementation, the agenda looks into translating uh, our initiatives into what we call uh, diversify economies, where agriculture share in GDP uh, is not the only is not the biggest one, but we have a multi-sectoral approach into in terms of transformation, where different sectors are contributing to uh, inclusive growth. So we would like to have in the next 50 years a rise of a modern industrial uh, and a service economy, a translation of Africa youth bulging to demographic dividend, uh, and access to social services that meet minimum standard of quality, and this is regardless of location, reduce of gender inequality, uh, and this should be done within an inclusive prosperity, uh, reduce potential for violent confrontation, and the creation of conducive uh, environment for peace uh, and security. So, uh, next please. Uh, let me just uh, show a few trends. So this is uh, the agenda give us, next please, uh, the agenda give us uh, basically uh, a vision for the future. So we're trying to project ourselves uh, to 2063 and we have an idea about what we want to become in the next 50 years. But unfortunately, when we look at our current path uh, and the trajectory we are in, uh, we can just see that uh, about 60% of our workforce in the continent are in, uh, into agriculture. 80% of those 60% are smallholder farmers. And they are all within the confine of the rural uh, setting where we don't have infrastructure, we don't have services, we don't even have policies that link those 80% uh, uh, properly into, into markets, into uh, uh, into basically uh, uh, wealth creation uh, initiatives. Uh, we conducted recently a, a study, uh, what we call a foresight study uh, on ending hunger. And the idea was to see uh, what would happen if we continue in this growth. Would we be able to feed ourselves, let's say just in, in 10 years? And the results are saying that we are not in the path of meeting our commitments uh, to achieving uh, zero hunger by 2025 uh, if we keep business as usual. So we need to do uh, put in place uh, a lot of uh, policies, uh, put a lot of investment into the different sectors to be able to catalyze basically that growth. Uh, next please. Uh, but fortunately, we have put in place uh, some mechanism. And one of the mechanisms that we have put in place is what we call uh, the CADEP. Uh, which is a comprehensive African uh, agricultural development program. So CADEP is in uh, its a second iteration. So we implemented CADEP for 10 years. Uh, and uh, during those 10 first years, we mostly uh, try to get something right, meaning that w how we can uh, get countries to put in place the processes that are necessary to, to help them uh, raise the profile of agriculture within the continental agenda and then also create a, a, a policy space for different actors to help the countries uh, push for agriculture development. Next please. Then at the end of uh, 2014, which, is, uh, which was marking basically the first 10 years of CADEP implementation, we, we decided to basically have a spot check, stop a little bit and see what we have achieved so far. Uh, and what can, kind of lesson we can draw from it. Uh, and then based on, uh, on those uh, lessons learned, I will cover them in a few minutes, uh, we came back with a, 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 new, a, new, a new guiding framework that we call the Malabo Declaration that uh, we heard uh, in the opening ceremony uh, being mentioned. So the Malabo Declaration has seven commitments. So there is a commitment uh, to principle and value of cutter processes, there is a commitment to bring private sector investment and finance into agriculture. There is a commitment of ending hunger by 2025, which is of interest to, to our discussion today. Uh, we have a commitment on halving poverty and, uh, and the like. 
So on the second that is of interest, one of the issues that uh, the head of state have uh, agreed on is to commit to ending hunger by 2025. Uh, and this, we, this means that we have to put in place uh, or strengthen the different policies that we have uh, and then basically try to improve investment into, into the sector. Uh, they also committed to bringing stunting uh, to 10% uh, and underway to by, to, by, uh, to, to 5% by 2025. Unfortunately, as I indicated in, uh, in my previous slide, uh, the current path that we have will not help us achieve these goals if you keep business as usual. Next, please. So, but the good thing is like the new framework on, uh, on Malabo, uh, is more uh, inclusive, is more evidence-based. Uh, it creates a program that is more uh, more uh, broad, uh, and then it, it links. It is linked to national budget cycles, uh, so that the country can put uh, the appropriate uh, uh, attention uh, to the implementation. So the other thing also that is new with uh, with this new uh, Malabo commitment is that now we're linking economic policy to agriculture. Instead of just talking about agriculture per se, we are trying to open it up to uh, look at something that is more uh, multi-sectoral. Uh, then we have some tools that we, have, we are utilizing uh, to basically make sure that those tools and instruments will help guide, guide the country. And those are the Cadabrizol framework and the joint sectoral reviews and, and the like. Uh, next, please. So how we do it? Uh, when you go into the country, we have like different steps that are basically captured here. Where first we can be making sure that now Malabo is domesticated, meaning that we help you to uh, revisit your agricultural investment plan, and based on that, help you to align it to Malabo so that you can take into consideration all those seven commitments that I mentioned. Uh, once you finalize this, we mobilize a team of experts to come to help you do what we call an independent technical review, which is ITR, and support you to convene a business meeting. Uh, okay, thank you. So a business meeting, uh, and then uh, we also monitor the accountability. Next, please. So far, what we have achieved is, 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 is tremendous, because uh, uh, as of now, we have 45 countries out of the 55 that has already launched the CADE processes, uh, which is a tremendous success at the continental level. We have 42 countries that have signed officially the what we call the CADEP Compact, which are the national strategy for agricultural development. We have 42 countries that have translated those agricultural investment, uh, those compacts into what we call the NIP, which is the National Agricultural Investment Plans. We have 38 that has received support from the African Union, particularly Nepal and Drea, to, con to translate basically those, uh, those NIPE into something that is bankable. Uh, so they have convened a business meeting, and 31 have already uh, mobilized resources, and they are implementing it. So I think in terms of, uh, of success story, we can say the CADEP has been really a good success story in terms of strengthening the planning processes at the country level and using the NIPE as a rallying document to uh, mobilize private sector funding. Uh, so now, uh, next please. So what have we learned over the last 10 years? We have learned a few things. One, if you have strong NIPES, they can help you to mobilize private sector investment. Two, agriculture is multi-sectoral. Because it's multi-sectoral, it needs coordination. Uh, and then usually, uh, you need both coordination at national level and coordination at the regional level. So there is a need, uh, one lesson that we learned from the first uh, uh, decade and a half of implementing CADEP is that we need to, to strengthen the RECs, which is the regional economic communities, to facilitate that coordination at the, at the national level and at the regional level. Uh, we also uh, realize that one of the commitments made during the first decade is that countries have to allocate 10% of their national GDP to agriculture for them to grow agriculture productivity by 6% annually. But we realize that we should not just only bank on the countries, uh, on the country budget. We need to bring private sector investment into agriculture if you want to transform. The last uh, also lesson we learn is that sometimes you can have a very good investment plan, you can have uh, resources are, are available, but when you go, go to the country, you realize that you have a systemic lack of capacity for implementation. 
so we realize that we need to put in place a mechanism uh, to the creation of what we call technical networks so that we can help country uh, have that capacity available on need by deed basis. Uh, next please, and I'll conclude with this, uh, this slide. So the way forward. Uh, although CADEP was developed before the Agenda 2063, the two frameworks are completely aligned. They are not mutually exclusive, they speak the same language. The CADEP framework identified key targets during the first decade of its implementation, which included, uh, as I indicated, the 6% agricultural growth rate at national level and an allocation of 10% uh, budget. Uh, in pursuing those goals, uh, we have put in place different instruments, uh, some that promote what we call peer learning, dialogue, uh, 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 so, and that we have what we call the CADEP partnership platform that we convene once a year, and this year it will be convened in Gabon, I think, in, in, in April. Uh, and then we have also what you call the permanent secretary of agriculture retreat where we bring people together to learn from each other and see how we, they can address certain issue we have developed instruments to strengthen implementation those are the national agricultural uh, investment plan and then also recently we have launched what we call the country uh, agribusiness platform uh, framework to help a country uh, bring the private sector uh, into strategic value chain uh, for investment. Then we have developed also the instrument for what we call mutual accountability uh, and the first uh, actually report on, uh, on the mutual accountability was presented before the head of state this past January uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, and this report really uh, showcased the countries that are on track to meeting uh, the, the targets and some countries that are not on, on track to meeting the target. So uh, these are uh, the few elements I wanted to share with you. Uh, so I'll end up here my presentation and I will let, thank you. Thank you very much, Hamadi. Brilliant presentation. And I think it spoke very, very neatly to the point that was raised um, by the NEPAT CEO's presentation this morning, where he said, sort of probably in the history of nutrition issues, there probably has never been this much global attention on this issue as there is today. Um, our, and sorry to uh, send you nasty notes, but we are really pressed for time. Our next presentation is going to be by another colleague, uh, Ms. Bibi Giosi. She's Senior Nutrition and Food Systems Officer officer in the office of the CEO at the NEPAD agency. Uh, FAO's loss is our gain because Bibi's been seconded to the NEPAD agency by FAO. Bibi, you have seven minutes. Thank you very much, Tandega, for the kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session. Uh, next slide, please. OK, we have had this morning uh, on the challenges and impacts and consequences of malnutrition. So I'd just like to emphasize the importance and the need for focusing on nutrition because I personally believe that nutrition is really the alpha and the omega of human, social, and economic development. The world has committed to giving everyone the right to access food and good nutrition. But how are we performing in this, in this regard? We are still plagued by different forms of malnutrition. What are you talking about? Undernutrition, overnutrition, and the lack of vitamins and minerals in our diets. This leads to a situation that is not simply tenable. Next, please. Here again. You can see on this... Uh, can you please advance? No, before. Okay, apparently we can't. Okay, let's just move to this one. Okay, uh, this slide captures the challenge that we are facing. Just go to the next one. Yeah, okay. This slide basically captures the challenge and the magnitude that we are having to deal with. As you can see, many countries are not on track to achieve the goal of attaining optimum food security and nutrition. There are several challenges in terms of public health importance. 
in terms of the lack of uh, requisite vitamins and minerals. In this regard, we see on this slide that many countries are not on track to achieve the reduction of iron deficiency anemia, which unfortunately affects mostly women of reproductive age and children. Secondly, we can see that adult overweight and obesity is on the increase. 55 or so countries are not on track to achieve this goal. But it was mentioned this morning that focusing on a thousand days is critical. Why? Because this is the most important window of opportunity from conception to by the time the child is 23 or 24 months of age. If the child is not accessing the right levels of nutrients, they will not develop properly in terms of their mental acuity and in terms of their physical stature. So only a few countries are showing in green to say that these countries are on track of achieving some of the commitments and some of the targets. I think this is a very dismal picture and we should ensure that in the decade that we are looking at we must improve and we should improve on these indicators. Next, please. Let me just uh, take uh, one minute to point out to you, fellow delegates, that many countries in Africa are not able to feed their children properly. So on this slide, you can see that the red indicates countries that are not able to provide uh, adequate acceptable diet. And then the one in blue are those countries that are not able to give their children the minimum required dietary diversity. So less than 50% and almost less than 10% in some countries, this is not achievable. So I think for me this is a travesty. But why are we concerned about this uh, scenario? Next please. We are concerned because, as we heard from some of the speakers this morning, that the impacts and consequences of malnutrition are far-reaching for the individual human being and for, for society at large. I just mentioned the challenge with cognitive development. If an individual during their young years are not able to access optimum nutrition, cognitively, they cannot develop well. What does that do? They are then exposed, obviously, to intergenerational levels of malnutrition. Because, I mean, as they say, poverty always begets poverty. So we have to make sure that we nip this uh, challenge in the bud. And then, of course, there are challenges of physical impairment and damage. But we are losing a lot of lives unnecessarily due to something that is so preventable as hunger and malnutrition. So all that put together, it leads us to the next level of disadvantage as a continent. Next, please. So at societal level, our societies are suffering because of high malnutrition rates. We are experiencing high costs in education due to repetition and due to children dropping out. We are experiencing high public assistance costs, and we are also experiencing high costs of medical care and medical and health care. And our productivity is compromised because of our physical impairment and equally because, more importantly, of our mental you know, impairment. So we are, ex we are really at a stage where if we are not careful, we will remain a continent that we will not be able to achieve the SDGs. Next, please. Um, I'm also of the conviction that really without nutrition, we cannot or will not be in a position to achieve all of the 17 SDGs. Fortunately, unlike the MDGs, the SDGs provide us with an opportunity through SDG 2 specifically that explicitly spells out nutrition as a priority. However, it is also recognized that the second level of SDGs also contribute to nutrition and nutrition contributes to those SDGs. So all in all, we should be looking at the SDGs through a nutrition lens, as the CEO of NAPAD said this morning. So now, with this understanding, next please, 
Uh, you may be asking yourselves, what has NAPA done or what is NAPA doing in the context of addressing the dire challenge of hunger and malnutrition? Next, please. NAPA, since it's uh, setting up in 2003, and the program of nutrition, please go first, just go ahead. We have several programs that address uh, hunger and malnutrition. Please keep going. Uh, the first one, obviously, due to the vulnerability of these two groups, focuses on maternal and child nutrition. The second one, because of its very nature of being a win-win-win homegrown school feeding has been rolled out to several countries on the continent. And of course, because many of our populations still consume high levels of staples, we have decided that it's critical to fortify these food commodities with the essential vitamins and minerals. Next, please. I guess the presentation has decided to go. But I mean, what is our vision? I mean, the vision is really to ensure that uh, our continent is hunger-free and it's malnutrition free. But we also recognize that as NEPAD, we cannot do anything, as uh, my colleague Hamadi said, without the right levels of capacity and skills. So we have sought to train, uh, to build capacity around mainstreaming and integrating nutrition in several development agendas, particularly in agriculture and related fields. Next, please. I, I don't know if it's working. And then we also have been working on the cost of hunger with several of our partners to try and understand the economic impacts or consequences of this malnutrition. And then very recently, uh, an initiative called the Initiative for Food and Nutrition Security in Africa, otherwise known as IFNA, has been launched in 2016 to further support and accelerate the implementation of nutrition in Africa. In doing all this, we cannot do much unless we have good data and good information and good evidence. So we are working on knowledge products, knowledge management to be able to garner you know, the required evidence to be able to direct policies and to direct programs. And we trust that our parliamentarians will be a conduit and champions through which we can be able to achieve a holistic approach to addressing the challenges of hunger and malnutrition on the continent. I thank you. Um, thank you very much, Bibi. Your presentation actually was an eye-opener to me. Just listening to you, talking about basic things like nutritional diversity, something we often take for granted uh, with our own children. So uh, I really, really appreciated the very concrete, concrete examples you used in bringing this home to all of us. Um, our next presentation is by Dr. Mawuli Sabla. Sabla. He is Chief Technical Advisor on Nutrition at FAO's Regional Office for Africa. Um, I think, was, as was mentioned by the SG of the IPU this morning, the, the role of parliamentarians on this issue is key because they have a key role in advocacy. So we are looking forward to hearing some more about how, what they can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And once again, thank you for, to NEPAD and the PAP for this high level event. Um, some of the things that this presentation highlights has been also uh, presented by Bibi, so those, I'll try to quickly maybe just go to some of the key elements in terms of concrete actions when it comes to what we need to be doing with the parliamentarians to resolve this challenge. Um, we have been engaging with the Pan-African Parliament, I think, for the past three years. We had had several advocacy missions here in Midrand and presented actually the uh, roles of parliamentarians to be able to change the dynamics of the how we are doing business um, so that we can make impact. And we know parliamentarians are very influential when it comes to uh, mobilizing even resources at their constituent level to address this challenge. We are telling government that we cannot have 40% of your population stunted and expect them to grow up to become meaningful uh, contributors to development. And also, they become a very high burden to the to the budgets, and so it's better for us to prevent than to try to, to cure. 
And that's why uh, FAO with the Pan-African Parliament, we established the Pan-African Parliamentary Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. And then we signed a memorandum of understanding with the PAP. And currently we have developed a technical cooperation program to really allow us to engage concretely with the parliamentarians on what the priorities to, should be when it comes to legislative instruments, when it comes to advocacy, when it comes to budget allocations, when it comes to, comes to multi-sectoral coordination to be able to address this challenge. So um, the right to adequate food is, is a human fundamental human right. And all legislators understand that they have a very important role to contribute when it comes to meeting this right. It is an aspirational right. But we, are, we hope that government will understand that this is an important right and fundamental to their development. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, just, just click on again. I just brought this slide to indicate that when you take all other risk factors, when it comes to morbidity and mortality, the way we eat and what we eat and our behavior is fundamental. So the risk associated with poor diet is much higher than combining the risk of uh, smoking, uh, dangerous sex, or whatever you can count as, or drinking or alcohol. Combining all these different risk factors to morbidity and mortality, what we eat is critical. So we want optimal nutrition, balanced diet. We want lifestyles that ensure that the overall human person feels adequate in terms of his capacity to be able to contribute to development. So just quickly go on to those other slides. Next. The next slide, please. So fundamentally, we have developed um, a technical cooperation program with the Pan-African Parliament, uh, which we have started implementing, focusing on how we really, really reinforce the capacity of, of parliamentarians, uh, and this is key. So we are looking at reinforcing the Pan-African Parliamentary Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. We are also uh, looking at the important role when it comes to enshrining the right to food in constitutions. We are looking at issues around making sure that the regulatory frameworks are not just developed or the legislations are not developed, not just developed, but they are implemented and complied with. So vis-a-vis -vis what the private sector is serving to our population when it comes to high sugar, high salt, ultra-processed fat, BB made reference to fortification in terms of compliance, very important. So we need legislation around all these different areas and, and components. Just go on, because I've already made reference to some of the issues. Um, yes, go ahead. So we have several commitments. I will not belabor the points. The next slide, please. Policy environment. These policy environments, we, make, we made reference to them earlier in the various speeches, but they serve as an entry point for us to really do business differently. So whether you're talking of the Malabo, you're talking of the SDGs, you're talking of the Arise Initiative, which is Africa Renewed Initiative for Stunting Elimination, or the Africa Renewed, uh, Africa Regional Nutrition Strategy, these are good. We have a lot of policy document. Going into implementation is key. So how do we get the private sector to add micronutrients to staples that are highly consumed? How do we make sure that there's high coverage of universal salt hydration, fortified flour, fortified oil? How do we include nutrition education in the way we do school feeding programs to make sure that we are not just feeding the children even with products that are imported, but making sure that nutrition education and local uh, farmers in terms of family farms are linked to our school food nutrition programs. How do we mainstream nutrition education also into agricultural extension training programs? And how do we ensure that the vulnerable women and children are capacitated with social protection schemes to be able to move them from vulnerability into productivity so that they can be able to meaningfully contribute to, to, uh, the, to, to overall optimal nutrition outcome? Let's go to the next slides. Let's next, why parliamentarians? The role of parliamentarians, I think this is very, very key. It's been already emphasized uh, several times. But we just want to 
keep on highlighting the importance of advocacy, importance of um, sufficient budgetary allocations, the importance of ensuring nutrition and food security priority focus is a priority focus of government and holding government accountable for all the commitments, both at global level and also at national level, but more importantly, to promote the enabling environment for us to be able to, to, to meet our commitment and be, being accountable and demanding also accountability from all the different sectors. For example, a lot of countries have adhered now to the Sun Movement. Nutrition is at the level of the Prime Minister's office or the President's office. We need to be able to hold accountable the different sectors because you can have diversified food, you can have um, clean water, but if you are, if you, if you, I mean, if you are not informed in terms of understanding and having the knowledge and the, the means to be able to afford these things, you will not be able to fully benefit from them. So it's very important that we ensure that accountability is ensured by all the different sectors. The next slide, please. Then FAO, in terms of supporting you, the parliamentarians, we are developing various tools, capacity development tools, policy briefs. We have a lot of um, uh, publications, communications, and consultations, and facilitating this dialogue. So wherever, whenever you are having your annual sessions, we plan with the different vice president, we meet with them, with the different parliamentarians at the level of the Agricultural Committee and the Pan-African Parliamentary Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, and we, we dialogue, we discuss, and we make sure we make these tools available to you to use to be able to make those policies and, and frameworks that needs to be in place. And then we also facilitate experience sharing between the Latin America, European Parliament, Three Alliance, the Africa Alliance, Japan, and all other uh, Pan-African Parliamentary Alliances that are looking into ensuring advancing the food security agenda. The next uh, slide. So this technical cooperation program is really focusing on ensuring that we reinforce your capacity on food security nutrition and that we ensure that we support the alliance and making sure that you understand what it means when it comes to the right to food being enshrined into constitution and how to go into implementation. The next slide. So in conclusion, evidence-based policies and regulation instrument to address food security and nutrition challenges is, is very principal. We need to strengthen national, currently we are actually establishing nas at national level um, alliances and also at sub regional level. We want to ensure a coordinated effort from the Pan-African Parliamentary Alliance at the continental level to the sub regional level with RECs like ECOWAS, SADC, EGAD, and make sure that that also is linked to what is, being, what is happening in terms of technical support to the parliamentary alliances in uh, specific countries. So currently, we, in this technical cooperation program, we are focusing on four countries from each of the sub-region. So you have Sierra Leone, you have Uganda, you have Madagascar, and you have Cameroon. So we have countries from each of the four regions. We, we have our Near East that is also working with Northern African colleagues to develop a different TCP. And then we want to ensure that we facilitate and support you to enact laws and legislation. Currently, there is a consultant that is working, going to be working with the PAPS to be able to understand what those priority um, legislative instruments should focus on and how do you go about developing them and ensure provision of adequate resources for countries to be able to take this policies and implement them and ensure compliance going forward. And then the last slide. Just by way of policy briefs, we are looking at policy briefs that are focusing on right to food in constitutions, framework laws on right to food, legislation on school food and nutrition, enabling legal environments for governance of land tenure in the context of food security nutrition. There will be briefs on nutrition intervention like biofortification, food fortification, dietary diversification, nutrition education in ag extension, nutrition education in school food and nutrition, legal measures to achieve the SDGs, because you have seven, out of the 17 goals, you have 12 of them that have direct nutrition uh, related uh, uh, indicators. Then multisectoral engagement and how do we institutionalize these multisectoral platforms at national level. I believe that we will be able to you know, really uh, make a difference when we have our parliamentarians fully engaged and fully embodied. Um, in November 2018 in Madrid, we have the Global Parliamentary Summit Against Malnutrition, which would also, uh, FAO is really supporting to, to, to organize, and we are looking forward to see a lot of uh, African parliamentarians at that uh, uh, 
summit. And, and together we can really make Africa free. I believe it is possible. Our director general say it is possible in our generation, but we have to move from rhetorics into concrete actions. We have to monitor and go to scale. We have to make sure that we understand what the issues are, what the strategies, what the interventions should be, take them to scale, and make sure that we, we focus also on the first 1,000 days and women, because once the harm is done, we cannot reverse it. So it's very important on focusing on the 1,000 days and also on women. So we, want, we, are, we are really excited that the parliamentarians are fully on board with the Pan-African Parliamentary Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, and we have national level alliances, sub-regional level alliances, and together we can really uh, address these challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Dr. Sabla for, again, a presentation rich in very concrete examples of how FAO is engaging with, with PAP and, and with a, a wider range of parliamentarians on this issue. Um, and it's fortunate that our penultimate presentation is actually by a parliamentarian, a very distinguished one. The Honorable Aminata Niang is second vice president of the Women's Caucus of PAP. She's also a member of the Agricultural Committee here. And so I think uh, her intervention directly following this intervention will be very interesting to hear uh, in terms of, again, this very, very important role parliamentarians have on this issue. Deputy, vous avez la parole. Merci, Madame la Présentatrice. Bismillah Alors, c'est pour moi un grand plaisir de vous donner un, un aperçu de l'engagement euh, des parlementaires panafricains en faveur de la sécurité alimentaire et la nutrition. Comme nous le savons tous, euh, en Afrique, la sécurité alimentaire et la, nutri et la nutrition constituent un des axes essentiels du programme de développement du continent. Et l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine qui définit la vision et le plan d'action pour le développement du continent euh, au cours des 50 années à venir, euh, en est euh, bien sûr la preuve. Le premier plan décennal de mise en œuvre donc, euh, de cet agenda euh, et a été ad adopté, bien sûr, et couvre sept domaines prioritaires alignés sur les objectifs de développement durable. Ces priorités sont définis dans la déclaration de Malabo de 2014, euh, donc sur la croissance et la transformation accélérée de l'agriculture pour une prospérité partagée et de meilleures conditions de vie. L'engagement de Malabo de 2014, qui appelle à éliminer la faim et à réduire la prévalence du retard de croissance à moins de 10%, et à celle d'insuffisance pondérante à moins de 5% à l'horizon 2025, incarne les objectifs de l'agenda du continent relatif aux deux secteurs, bien sûr, à l'alimentation et à la nutrition. Toutefois, malgré les progrès qui ont été, bien sûr, réalisés en matière de l'amélioration de la production et de la productivité agricole, les problèmes euh, liés à la sécurité alimentaire et à la nutrition reste posée avec acuité euh, dans beaucoup de pays africains. En effet, les statistiques ont montré, que, comme il a été mentionné d'ailleurs avant moi, que plus de 58 millions d'enfants africains de moins de 5 ans souffrent de retard de croissance et que euh, il a été noté également que dans les 54 euh, pays africains, les populations sont confrontées aux problèmes de surpoids et euh, d'obésité. Alors, les actions et interventions en matière de sécurité alimentaire et de nutrition doivent être améliorées pour pouvoir répondre efficacement à ces problèmes cruciaux dont continue à souffrir notre continent. Ce qui nécessite bien sûr euh, l'engagement et l'implication de tous les acteurs en vue de mettre en place une synergie d'action euh, permettant bien sûr de résoudre ces problèmes. Le Parlement panafricain, 
conscient, bien sûr, du rôle important qu'il peut jouer dans ce domaine, s'est engagé à faire de la sécurité alimentaire et de la nutrition une priorité. Ainsi, à travers sa commission euh, économie rurale, agriculture, environnement et ressources naturelles, et bien sûr en collaboration avec euh, des partenaires comme euh, le NEPAD, la FAO, euh, la Commission de l'Union africaine, le, la Commission a décidé de prendre en charge tous les dossiers permettant donc de contribuer à l'amélioration de la sécurité alimentaire et de la nutrition dans le continent. C'est ainsi que nous avons eu à faire des séances de travail, des ateliers sur, sur différents thèmes. La, le, le, le programme détaillé pour le développement de l'agriculture en Afrique. Euh, nous avons également étudié la stratégie africaine sur les ressources animales. Nous avons euh, étudié également la déclaration de Malabo et les objectifs de développement durable, comme nous avons eu également à étudier dans, au sein de la Commission de l'agriculture les problématiques des changements climatiques ainsi que l'accès à la terre. Euh, le Parlement panafricain est allé encore plus loin en, bien sûr, mettant en place des les résolutions en faveur de la création euh, d'un comité de suivi sur les objectifs de développement durable et d'une alliance panafricaine sur la sécurité alimentaire et la nutrition, comme il a été mentionné euh, avant. La création de ces organes constitue une illustration claire de l'engagement des parlementaires panafricains en faveur de la sécurité alimentaire et de la nutrition. Nous sommes convaincus que ces organes permettront de renforcer et d'orienter les actions du Parlement panafricain euh, par rapport, bien sûr, à la promotion et au plaidoyer en faveur de la mise en œuvre de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine au titre de l'aspiration 1, une Afrique prospère, fondée sur la croissance inclusive et le développement durable. Nous sommes convaincus également que ces organes permettront également de suivre et d'évaluer le progrès réalisé dans les États africains par rapport à l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable, notamment en ce qui concerne l'élimination de la faim et la pauvreté en Afrique. Ces organes travailleront bien sûr en étroite collaboration avec les parlements nationaux, la Commission de l'Union africaine et bien sûr avec les, les, les communautés économiques régionales pour relever ce défi. Euh, en réalité, nous sommes euh, convaincus que après la mise en euh, l'entrée en vigueur bien sûr du protocole révisé du Parlement panafricain, le pape pourra euh, contribuer plus efficacement et plus effectivement à l'élaboration de politiques et de législations adéquates tant au niveau continental que régional et national. Le pape pourra euh, élaborer enfin les doigts types qui permettront de guider les États africains dans le cadre de l'élaboration de leur législation nationale, surtout quand il s'agit de questions transversales qui, peuvent être, qui ne peuvent pas être réglées, bien sûr, par un seul, par un seul État. Bref, euh, nous pouvons dire que l'engagement du Parlement panafricain est un engagement euh, très sérieux et ferme. Et c'est un engagement qui, selon nous, euh, permettra de contribuer positivement à l'amélioration des conditions de vie de nos populations en Afrique. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Madame la députée, pour votre discours. Um, C'était très intéressant, surtout sur le lien entre la Commission de l'Union africaine et le pape. Okay, I'm going to need guidance from the organizers whether we have time for one or two very quick pointed questions. Um, can I have guidance? Do we have time? A, well, since I have no guidance, I'm going to take questions. Um, can, I, can I just take very succinct, brief questions directed to a specific speaker on any of the issues that they raised? Can I have? 
Uh, yes, please go ahead. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Je m'appelle Dr. Saloun Sissé. Je viens de la Guinée. Euh, je remercie beaucoup euh, les présentateurs parce que ça a été un travail quand même très exhaustif. Euh, mais je voudrais quand même attirer votre attention sur euh, un état de fait. Parce que qui parle d'alimentation parle de terre et de sol. Je sais que la FAO a beaucoup fait au niveau de nos différents pays pour euh, ce qui concerne la connaissance des sols. Mais au niveau continental, il est important quand même de capitaliser euh, ces données pour que, euh, au niveau des spécificités, nous pouvions quand même avoir une politique euh, générale. Ce que je veux dire, c'est qu'en amont de toute production, c'est la connaissance édifique des sols qui sont euh, la connaissance des sols qui est nécessaire pour que la mise en valeur soit une euh, mise en valeur euh, heureuse. Euh, mais partout, là, les différents exposants n'ont pas essayé de parler de la connaissance des terres, surtout les clés de mise en valeur. Il faut nécessairement que cette politique, les, toute politique agricole, soit basée sur la connaissance exhaustive des sols, entre parenthèses, des terres. Et ça manque beaucoup au niveau de nos pays. Et tant que nous n'avons pas les clés de mise en valeur, la productivité sera minimisée. Merci. Alors, donc, voilà ce que je voulais dire pour que vous puissiez quand même prendre ça dans votre politique quotidienne pour une réussite. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. That was more a comment than a question. Very briefly. And then we have to wrap. Shukran, Okhtar Raisa, Munazima Lilla Azal Amal. Shukran, Okhtar Raisa, Munazima Lilla Azal Barnamik. Sultan Hashim Osman Hashim. Sudan. عضو برلمان عموم افريقيا استمعنا الى كثير من العروض الممتازه والجيده وسؤالي نحن في بيئه اذا تحدثنا عن مشروعات الفاو او المجاعات او التغير المناخي واذا تحدثنا من الجانب الاخر الى الجهود المبذوله من قبل البرلمانات والدول والحكومات والمنظمات الحكومية والمنظمات الغير حكومية في مسألة التغذية والمجاعة والمياه النظيفة والبيئة النظيفة هذه الجهود استمرت لسنوات طويلة وعديدة ولكن إلى هذه اللحظة في إفريقيا تحديدا وفي العالم إذا يعني ركزنا على مسألة التغير المناخي وأسروا على البيئة وأسروا على الزراعة وأسروا على المياه وأسروا على التغذية كيف لنا أن نجمع هذه الجهود كلها حتى تسمر إلى حل هذه الإشكاليات وهذا الحديث ربما تكرر سنوات أو عقود من الزمان ويتكرر هذا الحديث ويتجدد وتتشخص المشكلة من جديد إذا ما هي سؤالي الآن ما هو الطريق الذي يوصلنا إلى الحلول المباشرة التي تؤثر في كل هذه المجالات والخروج بخاصة من إفريقيا التي يعني يحيطها المرض والفقر والجهل كيف نخرج؟ هنالك سياسات متعددة، هنالك برلمانات، هنالك اتحادات. كيف نجمع هذه الجهود حتى تكون تؤثر حلاً مؤثراً وحلاً على الأرض يأخذ 
في الاعتبار كافة التحديات وكافة الصعوبات الاقتصادية والسياسية والاجتماعية وتعقيدات الأرض ثم بعد ذلك القوة العظمى التي تؤثر في المناخ العام وتؤثر في انبعاثات الغازات التي تؤثر في البيئة الكلية للإنسان شكرا أختي الرئيسة Thank you very much. Again, more comment than question, but there was an element. How many can I impose on you to, to address the climate change issue? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think uh, the gentleman from Sudan raised some very interesting questions. One of them is uh, on way forward that I have already uh, touched on during my, uh, my presentation. Uh, and then also how can uh, Africa get rid of many of the ill policies that we have put in place to uh, address some of the key elements that uh, some of the key challenges that we are faced with. Uh, on the issue of climate also there is another question that was raised and I will just want to give a specific example on uh, Sudan uh, since the gentleman is from Sudan. So. Um, Last week, uh, I was in, uh, I think it was a week and a half ago, I was in Sudan attending the FAO meeting, uh, the Af uh, FAO Regional Africa meeting. And uh, while I was there, I uh, took the, uh, I was uh, fortunate to meet with the Sudanese uh, authorities, particularly the permanent secretary of, uh, of Sudan, to discuss particularly on these issues that he, that was just raised. Uh, and uh, 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 an official memo was uh, addressed to the Nepal CEO to see how we uh, can partner with Sudan to address some of the issues raised by by uh, by, uh, by the Honourable uh, Representative of, of Sudan. Uh, so my take on uh, the question raised is that when we want to transform uh, in the long run, we need to go to to, to four four steps. The first step is how uh, to address the issue on how we can increase our production productivity, which is uh, one of the key uh, components of the Malabo Declaration. Once we address the issue of raising production productivity, and when I say raising production productivity, it is in, it is in the larger sense of Malabo, we need to uh, next look at how agriculture can be the driving force to generate enough resources to be reinvested into some other sectors. So this is the second step of the transformation process. The third step of the transformation process is once you have generated enough resources to trickle down to other sectors, agriculture becomes the pooling, uh, pooling sector to address multi-sectorality. Uh, and then on the last one, you look at all the other issues on, uh, uh, on, 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 on resilience because you want the system to be resilient, and then that's when you address the issue of climate change, climate smart agriculture. So there are a lot of pro pro programs at the, continent, in the, uh, at the continental level being implemented addressing those issues. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they may be uh, very consistent when we look at them uh, at the national or individual level, but they may not be consistent when you look at them at the aggregate level. And that's one of the reasons why we developing these continental frameworks to make all countries move together so that we can achieve a common goal. So uh, I hope this, uh, this may uh, address your, uh, some of your answers. Thank you. Okay, so um, excellencies, colleagues, you know they, that expression, some have greatness thrust upon them. So that's my uh, unique position. We've been given more time. Um, what, the way we'll proceed now is that we're going to continue with this panel discussion uh, question period. We're going to, to dovetail it uh, with the session, the, the open discussion that we were supposed to have on experience chairing by parliamentarians, that the session that was supposed to be chaired by the Honorable Chair of the Agricultural Committee, uh, and then we'll break for lunch at one, and then have the second session after lunch. Um, so that, uh, can I ask for uh, interventions you can ask questions to the panelists on the past presentations, and can I also ask for interventions on specifically this topic on experience sharing by parliamentarians on nutrition and food security regulations, legislation, and advocacy. I mean, they're, they're linked topics anyway. Um, so that, uh, can I take a round of, of hands on this? And in, in the interim, I'll look for hands in the interim. I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Sadler to respond to the land issue question. 
you, you can go ahead. And then let me just take your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, merci beaucoup pour la question par rapport aux au importance sur les sols. Um, je pense que c'est justement il fait que, uh, un aspect important qu'on n'a pas oublié. Parce que quand j'ai listé même les différents uh, documents qui seront développés par la FAO, on a mentionné uh, les guides sur comment on gère, les guides sur la gestion de, de terre en Afrique. On a beaucoup de secteurs privés qui sont en train de venir maintenant accueillir les grands espaces et ils utilisent ça pour faire plusieurs euh, choses. Et Afrique a actuellement plus de terres arabes que d'autres continents. Et, et c'est important de mettre ça en valeur et s'assurer que ça répond d'abord aux besoins de nos populations. Donc, si on parle même de la productivité de cette sol, il faut s'assurer qu'on diversifie la production pour s'assurer la densité, promotion des, des, des aliments qui sont denses en micronutriments, les, les aliments biofortifiés et l'utilisation de non seulement même le sol, mais le sol et l'eau euh, qui est important, qui contribue également à la nutrition. Donc, la nutrition, c'est vraiment multisectoriel. Et c'est important de comprendre le rôle de chaque secteur en termes de contribution euh, euh, à, à, à l'amélioration de, de, de la nutrition. Donc, je pense que le sol n'est pas oublié et ça fait partie de la façon de gérer le sol, ça fait partie de la législation qui doit être développée et la FAO a beaucoup d'expérience dans ce domaine qui peut, être, qui peut se mettre au profit euh, des parlementaires pour développer ces, ces différentes législations. Et pour répondre aussi aux, aux problèmes soulevés par les Soudans, je pense que c'est les Soudans, Actuellement, c'est très, très important le point que vous avez soulevé parce qu'on a fait, on parle beaucoup, on fait beaucoup de rhétorique. Mais on sait, le problème, c'est qu'on sait quoi faire, on sait les problèmes, on connaît les problèmes. Mais comment résoudre les problèmes, c'est ça qui est, qui est notre problème. Comment travailler ensemble, comment créer plutôt les synergies, comment aller à l'échelle avec l'intervention qu'on sait peut faire un changement concret, c'est ça le problème. Donc, moi, j'ai dit, si on, on comprend, le rôle des secteurs privés, ils jouent un rôle capital, c'est eux qui produisent des aliments pour la population la plupart du temps. Si on comprend comment la population elle, elle travaille, le secteur privé, il faut contrôler comment il, comment il, il, il travaille, comment il fait le business. Et il faut contrôler avec les réglementations et les législations qui soient appliquées pour s'assurer que chacun conforme. Donc si on parle de, par exemple, on parle de, de, de serres, l'utilisation des serres, il faut s'assurer que le mécanisme de contrôle et de vérification soit mis en place. Si on parle de promotion des aliments dans un micronutriment, les biofortifications, on a des aliments qui sont riches en micronutriments en Afrique qui sont en train d'être disparus et la population qui sont en train d'être immergée sont en train de tourner vers le Kentucky Fried Chicken, tous les aliments qui ne sont, qui sont pas vraiment sains, les, 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 les boissons gazeuses, trop de sucre, trop de sel qui vraiment ne nous permettent pas de résoudre le problème à la base. Donc, il faut, c'est pourquoi le rôle des parlementaires est capital. Il faut la législation, il faut ce qu'on soit au, au, au bord pour contrôler et, et, et assurer la conformité à ces, à ces législations, à ces réglementations, à ces normes, pour résoudre les problèmes à la base euh, en termes d'actions concr concrètes. Donc, si on parle de la multisectorialité, il faut que ça soit institutionnalisé, et il faut que chaque secteur soit redévable en termes de leur contribution à l'amélioration de la nutrition. Merci. Okay, we, we only have 15 minutes, so again, can I have a, just a show of hands? I've got you, I've got you. Anyone on this side? Okay, let me just, uh, again, introduce yourself, and then uh, please clarify whether you have a question for the panel or whether you'd like to contribute to the, the broader open discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the moderator, and I thank the presenters. I'm Professor Latigo from Uganda. I would like to direct myself to the gentleman who presented on the agenda 63, and uh, I want to share with him and, and, and this meeting my concern. The reality that you presented, 60% of the Afri of we Africans are in agriculture, 80% of those in small-scale agriculture. 
I've been in the Faculty of Agriculture. I have been in Parliament for 15 years. Once you talk about multi-sectoral, you'll find that the 10% claim that we are making contribution to agriculture will include roads that children who go to school also use, that the business people who go to do business will also use. And when you flesh out the actual contribution to transforming this 60% and 80% and agricultural practices of Africa, the amount of resources becomes too small. And in my own view, that is where we should focus. Malaysia did that. They focused on the individuals who were defined as poor and who needed transformation and transformed. The rest of it, nutrition, are really consequential. You look at me, I cannot be part of that statistics because I've, I've been empowered. And so let us empower our rural Africans. And then many of the issues will fall on the way, wayside. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. Je suis l'honorable Kone Dognon de Côte d'Ivoire, sur le Parlement panafricain depuis 2012. Je voudrais parler de l'expérience de la Côte d'Ivoire avant d'en de, revenir à, à une intervention du dernier intervenant. Euh, la Côte d'Ivoire a accueilli le premier rassemblement mondial du mouvement SUN en novembre 2017. Ce mouvement a réuni près de euh, d'un millier de personnes ainsi que 80 pays membres du, du mouvement SUN. Lors de ce rassemblement, des engagements ont été pris à un très haut niveau. La Côte d'Ivoire a adhéré au mouvement SUN euh, par décret depuis novembre 2013. Au niveau de l'Assemblée nationale de Côte d'Ivoire, un réseau de parlementaires pour la sécurité nutritionnelle a été mis en place depuis euh, novembre 2016. Madame la modératrice, euh, euh, la dernière partie de mon intervention, je pouvais euh, passer parce que le dernier intervenant a posé la question et a répondu en même temps. Madame la modératrice, on crée des réseaux, on fait des projets, on fixe des agendas, des objectifs, on crée des mouvements, il y a des bureaux partout pour parler de euh, ce sujet-là. Madame la modératrice, il a dit tout à l'heure, on connaît le problème, mais comment faire pour mettre tout ceci en synergie Moi, j'allais simplement dire, et si on cessait de parler pour agir Merci, Madame la modératrice. Merci beaucoup, député. Um, do I, can I, that's an, actually a, a brilliant intervention. And can I just ask for any other intervention specifically on this topic of experience sharing by you parliamentarians on nutrition and food security regulation, legislation, and advocacy? And I'm, I know, uh, I don't even want to look at him, but I'm going to pick on the High Commissioner of Lesotho to, to pronounce on this issue, um, not only in his current capacity, but in his former capacity as a minister in this sector. Um, is there anything? in terms of Lesotho's experience in this area that you can contribute on this issue? I was very reluctant to stand up and talk about issues that I raised but I appreciate most highly the attempt to invite parliamentarians so that they should put pressure on governments to come up with uh, the need for supporting nutrition and food security in their countries. But having been in parliament myself, Having been a minister at some stage, I know where the problem lies. And I would wish that ministers of finance do at some stage get invited 
uh, when we talk issues of allocation. I remember when the issue of the Mozambique declaration of allocating about 7%, if I remember, uh, of the budget to agriculture, food security, and nutrition. How difficult it was when ministers sat together to allocate the budget and the difficulty of convincing the ministers to allocate such budget to, to agriculture. I just appreciate, was I appreciate the gesture of addressing the parliamentarians. I also feel that you should consider inviting ministers of finance and agriculture together because they need support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now you can see why I picked on you because this is a very concrete and very real intervention. We can theorize all we want, but if those who hold the purse strings are not in the room, um, then it remains at that level as theory. Um, can I ask for other intervention on this? Yes, Chair. Okay, thank you so much, and I want to appreciate the, the four presenters who have taken us through the very elaborate presentations. And I just want to re-echo what the former Minister of Lesotho, Lesotho was saying in regards to Ministers of Finance, and I want to give an experience of Uganda. Uh, I want to believe that there are so many interministerial and intergovernmental meetings that have taken place, the different uh, AU frameworks are put in two considerations. For example, let's talk about water. We have the African Minister's Council on Water. We have the in African Minister's Council on Environment, AMSE, NAMCAW, and all that. And the different high-level panels that ministers of finance, ministers relevant to different sectors meet. But I've seen all these high-level international panels being very relevant because normally the members of parliament are the ones who put task ministers in the floor. I've seen that ministers, after the meetings, can decide to do whatever they, they, they want. But in our case in Uganda, what we have done is to ensure that uh, in most of these delegations of ministers, especially on issues that are very pertinent in uh, addressing the SDGs and nutrition and hunger. Members of parliament, once their capacities are built, once they are very knowledgeable on an issue, once they are very knowledgeable on the commitments that the ministers have taken, they bring the ministers on spot in the floor of parliament to explain what have the, the, the roadmap they have put in place in terms of addressing the commitments that they have committed to on behalf of the people. Because normally when the ministers travel, it's just the ministry interministerial. And according to our constitution, the mandate is on the parliament, the mandate is on the legislature to represent the people and to put the executive to task to ensure that what they committed to is at the head. So I think that we should take the same precautions when we are talking about food and nutrition security. First, we must start by saying the summit agreed to addressing allocations of 10% to agriculture. That could as well be unpacked to address nutrition. But how many of the countries have committed and what, and what frameworks have been put in place to ensure? Even when I, I was listening to their presentation, even when 28 and more percent of um, and more of the countries have actually put down the CADAP roadmap and launched the CADAP. It's some of the countries just a launch, but when you follow up the implementation modalities and mechanisms, it's just a hoax. So I think that as members of parliament, when we are empowered to understand these frameworks and relate them to our challenges back home, in a village where I come from, where sometimes Children go up to evening without something in school. We look at the school feeding program. We look at how we can make these policies so that these uh, parents probably with, with government can ensure that children can have a cup of porridge at school. So we have to create a linkage between the local initiatives and the international initiatives and ensure that we 
we appropriate for them if there is money and we look at the targets. By the time I sign as a minister on behalf of Uganda, I should be in the knowledge to know that as a minister of finance, I need to refocus and guide my president, who is the head of state, to put money into agriculture. And so working hand in hand with ministers and parliamentarians, I think we will be moving at the right track in, make, in doing checks for the legislature and the executive because this this is an, a hand of government that can put the executive to to check in regards to addressing food and nutrition security in the countries i thought i would say that thank you no thank you very much chair for that intervention um while i'm in the mood i'm picking on people we have a distinguished south african parliamentarian chief mandela here and i know he's passionate about this issue in particular and i'm wondering chief if you could intervene on this issue, particularly on South Africa's experience on this. Um, in South Africa, we actually have two ministries responsible for this, one on agriculture per se, forest fisheries, and then another on rural development and land reform itself. And I'm wondering, you know, perhaps the conversation finance needs to equally be brought into that rubric of conversation on actually delivering on this issue. Well, thank you. I think uh, this is a portfolio committee I served on uh, uh, the agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And I think uh, at the time uh, when we were looking at uh, food security, it was to ensure that we partner with the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform to ensure that uh, we unpack uh, the land in rural areas in ensuring that uh, there's uh, attainability of food security and I think where the, a lot of the challenges are is in land distribution when you give land back to our people that uh, haven't been farming for such a long time. The certain land that uh, was acquired has found itself back to the hands of the previous owners. I think when we initiated uh, the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform we had had a target from 2009 to 2014 to be able to deliver about 30% of land through distribution, but uh, fell at a, a limit of uh, 7% due to the willing buyer, willing seller uh, policy that we adopted, which didn't work. And as a result of that, out of that 7% land that was redistributed, you find that about 4% has already found itself to the previous owners. And I think the policies need to ensure that the people that are giving the land back are able to effectively utilize the land for food production. I think uh, that's all I can share for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am, uh, we're running uh, low on time, so I'm going to throw the uh, issues back to the panel for any final comments and interventions, and then we're going to have to, we're going to have to wrap. I'm sorry, we're already at, at one. We'll continue this conversation over lunch. Uh, panelists, let me start on my right. Is that my right? I don't know. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that um, we are all speaking the same language, and if I go back to the very important point of the uh, honorable member from Cote d'Ivoire made that we need to go to action. Um, finance, very, very important. But when you have ministers of finance who do not understand the problem, they may not see why they should prioritize it. And that is why advocacy, continuous uh, sensitization and awareness creation, and that is why these alliances like Honorable Jacqueline made the point that the alliances at national level, at the level of parliament, we need to capacitate you with information, with the briefs, with the tools, so that when you stand and you are saying, look, it is not right to have 40% of our population, of our children, stunted. It is not right for children to be born, starting life with low birth weight, when you stand up to say, look, these are going to be burdens in the future and they are not going to contribute meaningfully to development, they know what you are saying. So we need to go to, 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 to scale. We need to make sure we have the synergy to bring together all the different sectors because agriculture is just one piece of the pie. You can have diversified food, like I said. You can be able to make sure that you produce all the nutrient-dense foods, but if water sanitation hygiene is not there, 
you cannot be able to meet your nutrition requirements. If you are not, you don't have the, the education to know when to eat, you'll eat at the wrong time, the right things, and sleep, but you still have health problems in terms of non-communicable diseases. So information is capital. Nutrition education must start from, from our primary schools. It's important. Look, I feel healthy. I feel strong. When, when you, it's, it's the beginning of quality of life. So it is important for us to be able to prioritize these interventions and go to scale. It doesn't cost anything to include nutrition education in our curriculum and make sure teachers are trained to have minimum understanding of what nutrition is. We are not transforming them into nutritionists, but they must have basic information to be able to teach the children. So that whilst we are doing school food and nutrition, we accompany it with nutrition education. Same goes with ag extension system. Nutrition education must go in. Food fortification, we have coverage of everybody eats oil. Everybody consumes salt. Everybody consumes some amount of sugar. When we fortify with essential micronutrients, we can meet certain proportion of recommended dietary allowances for specific micronutrients. So we need these integrated approaches to go to scale and enforce the laws and enforce the regulations. We need food-based dietary guidelines for countries. Because it's capital to know what we have available, what are their nutritional value, and how do, we, do they contribute. The local indigenous food that our middle class are shying away from and eating all the wrong things, we need to go back to them and add value to them and package them and make them available to our population. We need social protection. We, uh, we need to ensure appropriate infant and your child feeding practices. So these are all very, very important programs that need to scale, need to go to scale. So we stop talking and we go to action. And we go to parliament and say, look, if Africa has to develop, we need optimal, strong population to be able to move our development forward. I think this is what I would, I would say to the uh, thank you very much to the honorable uh, parliamentarians and contributors. Uh, in the interest of time, I just want to be very brief and succinct. I'll just, you know, speak to two points. One, which is uh, on coordination and the multisectoral nature of nutrition. It is true, nutrition falls in the ambit of so many sectors. That said, I think what remains Im important is that at national levels, we have a coordinated mechanism of different sectors working together, but coordinated not within a line or by a line ministry. It has to be coordinated at a higher level. It could be a ministry of uh, finance and economic development planning, or it could be in the prime minister's office or the president's office. This way, you have a higher a uh, level with cloud that can actually crack the whip on the other sectors and other ministries from, from several points of view. One, that of budget allocation itself. How much is agriculture put into us nutrition? How much is education? How much is health? How much is social protection? And so on and so forth. And also looking at trade and markets. What is the impact of the trade that we do within the continent, inter-country and inter-regional? Are we trading and marketing the right nutritious commodities? Are we promoting those? Then I'd just like to, to also, in the context of multi-sectoral coordination and implementation, hammer on the point of developing the relevant and requisite capacities. Like he said, we are not intending to turn everyone into a nutritionist, but we should be able to have with some highest degree of clarity what the different sectors' contribution should and must be and hold them accountable to that through this mechanism that I am sort of proposing. And for those countries that already have this mechanism, we have seen that they've made a lot of progress because there is a very clear line of command and line of accountability where no one can dodge the issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, let me just speak on, uh, on two issues also. One is the quality of uh, the investment, uh, which uh, our uh, honorable uh, representative from Uganda has, uh, has highlighted. Uh, and the second one, uh, I will discuss about some of the policies issue uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, 
Malabo was very clear on commitment made by head of state to increase uh, budget allocation, national budget allocation, or to, uh, to, to dedicate uh, national uh, budget, 10% uh, of the national budget to agriculture. And by doing so, if they complied with, this may lead to an increase of, uh, to an annual increase of production and productivity by 6%. And these numbers uh, were defined because uh, some studies have indicated that if we do that, we will be able to meet our need for food security. At the moment, we are very dependent on imports. If you look at uh, on an annual basis, our basically food bill is about $35 billion of food import. So we importing. Uh, as Madam Zuma was saying recently, we are oh, the only continent where we eat what we don't produce, we produce what we don't eat, and we import what we eat. And this has to change. So, uh, and it is sad that uh, we are in this situation, but for us to reverse the trend, we need to have a quality investment, meaning that when we say we are allocating 10% into agriculture development, we should not factor in the salaries we're paying for people who are working in the yeah. Department of Agriculture. We should not factor in the cars we are buying for the department, but we are really looking at real investment uh, into the agriculture sector that basically are leading to uh, production and productivity growth. So this is my first take on this one. The second uh, uh, issue I want to highlight is some of the comment I made uh, previously uh, in terms of the importance of the sector. Here we have a sector where 60% of our workforce is operating and 80% are in the rural area. And they are not connected to finance. Uh, we have some statistics that are indicating that at the moment agriculture contributes to 15.6% uh, of our export earnings and uh, some recent study by the World Bank are indicating that agro-business and agro-processing uh, are projected by um, 2030 to generate about a billion dollars uh, in the continent. At the moment the number is about 330. So we have basically some projections where we have a middle class that is growing. So we expect our middle class to be about 400 million people. Uh, I mean a growth uh, of 400 million people by 2030. Uh, so the demand for food is there. The pressure is there. Now the question is like how we can link uh, our smallholder farmers uh, to market at the moment. And I'm just giving here some very um, uh, conservative statistics. We have 50% of our smallholder farmers who are farming for subsistence. We have only 2% who are doing it for commercial issues. And we have a very big group in between that, are, that is connected on and off to the market. You as a parliamentarian, you can help change this dynamic by basically pushing for the creation of the enabling environment for those farmers to be uh, to be pulled from basically subsistence to commercial. And that's one of the reasons why we think agro-industrialization, as it is very well uh, captured in the Agenda 2063, uh, would be maybe our, our way forward. There are some very good success examples in the continent. I mean, if you go to Nigeria, the University of Ibadan, for example, has created a, a new variety of cassava that can yield more than 40%. Uh, without even fertilizers. But the problem is like if you go to Nigeria, you want to use cassava for, uh, let's say, into the beer, beer industry. Uh, you need to have basically a, a, a plant that, that will cover a 40, 40 kilometer ray to be able basically to move the production from smallholder farmers to, to the processing plant. But guess what? What is the problem? Infrastructure. You will not be able to move it because the infrastructure is not there. And this is something also that the parliamentarian can, can help in terms of creating the policy environment. You go in any African country at the moment, you have what we call uh, an agricultural bank. A bank that is designed 
to support the agriculture sector. But when you look at what the bank is doing in reality, it's a commercial bank. Because when you go there as a smallholder farmer, you try to get a loan, they will list a laundry list of risk uh, basically to, that basically prevent them from, from doing it. But in, in the developed countries, uh, the government has put some incentive to de-risk the sector. So this is also something that the parliamentarian can support with. Uh, and I can go on and on, on and on on the list of things that need to be done in terms of, of pushing it. So I think there is a good opportunity that we have here today to sensitize you on these issues. Uh, Dr. Mayaki usually has, a, and I'll say that in closing, uh, uh, sometimes he uh, shared with us a story uh, where we, ha he, we had a meeting with, a, uh, I think, with the director of planning of many uh, African uh, representative. And he asked them one question. He said, okay, uh, are you all familiar with CADEP? And these are the director that are in charge of doing the planning for budget at the national level. Few or almost close to zero knew what CADEP was. And yet, you can see in the presentation that I did early on, I said CADEP was a success story in terms of pushing countries to strengthen their planning processes. But the problem is agriculture is a multi-sector. And yet, we talk only to agriculture ministers. And this has to change. Thank you. Uh, moi, je vais surtout mettre l'accent sur uh, l'importance uh, d'impliquer davantage les parlementaires dans uh, ce processus. Uh, Certes, nous parlementaires, nous avons des prérogatives, nous pouvons contrôler le gouvernement, suivre euh, les programmes, mais euh, faute de renforcement de capacité, faute de background sur euh, ces questions cruciaux, cruciales, donc, euh, le, 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 la, donc la mission de contrôle et la mission d'appui de, 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 ne, ne sera pas effective. Il est, il est, il est très important donc d'impliquer et de renforcer encore davantage les parlementaires par rapport à toutes ces questions. Nous avons, euh, à Mauritanie, euh, le, le mois passé, nous avons eu un atelier de parlementaires euh, sur, sur, sur la question de, de nutrition. Et euh, on était vraiment surpris parce qu'on n'avait pas les données sur les statistiques par rapport au, au problème de nutrition en Mauritanie. Et quand on nous a fait ces, ces présentations, alors là, on était carrément euh, ébahis. Donc, euh, c'est dire que quand on n'a pas, on n'a pas le, 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 les données, on n'a pas les informations, on ne peut pas jouer son rôle euh, de manière efficace et effective. Euh, il y a lieu donc que nos partenaires approchent euh, les parlements nationaux également, comme euh, ils ont eu à le faire avec le parlement panafricain, ils doivent approcher également plus les parlements nationaux pour que ces, 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 ces parlementaires puissent être, être édifiés par rapport à toutes ces questions. Je vous remercie. So, excellencies, colleagues, um, I'll let you into a little secret. When Kefirwe and Bibi asked me to chair this panel, I started to whine. It's not my field of expertise. Can't they find somebody else? And I tell you what, I'm emerging from this panel educated, angry, excited, and empowered. So for that, thank you. Thank you very much. As my uh, final act before I relinquish the mic, can I ask you to give a huge round of applause to these brilliant presenters. They were fantastic. So, ladies and gentlemen, my work is done. Bon appétit et à très très bientôt. Um, let me ask one of the organizers if you can help us and assist us in our own food security uh, personal business. Thank you.
So we'll have the lunch at the canteen here and we'll uh, resume by half past two. The same. Yeah. Thank you. We will be guided to the canteen, so we shall follow Mr. Galal.